takes 10 seconds to start. Oh, it's posting. So now it should. Great. So. I mean, you can let me 
if you keep it exactly as it is right now. Um, okay, do you want to Oh, excuse me? Did you put them in the right category? Thank you. I think I know this guy over here. Are you streaming it? Really? Hello everyone, welcome to our last town hall of the year. My name is Melina Webb, I'm the chair of the Student Seminaries Council, I'm also a senior in the College of Arts and Science. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy days to come here um, for our open dialogue that we host um, twice a semester with the president of our university. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to ask any questions that you have, um, and it brings everything to our attention as well. Um, and just so everyone knows, this event is being live streamed. Um, we have the link um, if you're interested in seeing it afterwards. But if you are sitting in this front row over here, you can see folks know, um, you will be um, included on the live stream. So without further ado, I would like to introduce President Sexton. Hello, and, uh, any questions? What's the first question? What's the right? 
So the way this works is we have three categories, as I explained a couple of minutes ago. Um, it's academics, student life, and global network university. Um, and so if you'd like to submit a question during the event, just come up, feel free, drop it in the fishbowl. Um, we pick them at random, um, and we just separate them this way um, so we can ensure that we're not asking the same questions over and over. And we have about an hour and a half. I have yeah. to teach my class tonight, and I agree before that. So we might cut it about 5.30. And if you're in the room when I read your name and you'd like to ask the question, we'll just have you come up to the podium, and I will hand you your slip of paper. Um, the first question comes from Samantha Galvin. Are you here, Samantha? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so you can just come up over here to the middle. Um, can I just ask the answer? Do you mind if I stay here? Oh, okay, no, that's fine. Okay. Would you prefer if I read it? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, the first question is, um, do you keep up to date with the court cases against NYU? What legal measures um, is NYU willing to take to ensure that NYU 2031 happens as planned? Uh, there, are, there, there were two court cases against uh, the plan 2031. Uh, one of them is again was against NYU, brought by tenants uh, in, in not affiliated with the university, uh, saying that the, by uh, transforming the park which is between the two Washington Square Village buildings, which is on the north side, that uh, NYU would be depriving them of uh, service. We would be changing that park from being a private park, which it is now, to being a public park as part of the plan. That lawsuit was dismissed a couple of weeks back, if I remember correctly. Uh, I know it was dismissed. I'm just trying to recollect whether it was a couple of weeks back or not. Uh, they, of course, have a right to appeal if they choose to do that. If they do, uh, we, we expect the same result. We feel very, fairly strongly that uh, uh, the university is in a good position in that lawsuit. The, the other lawsuit is uh, technically not against NYU. We were, uh, it's the lawsuit that was brought by a whole host of groups, including probably most notably this group, the, the uh, faculty who oppose uh, what it what they call the Sexton Plan, which is essentially the plan that was approved uh, by the uh, City Council and before that by the City Planning Commission uh, that increased the zoning envelope. And so I think that all of you are probably familiar with this. Um, the university uh, owns the land in what's called the super blocks, which are the, the two sets of blocks that include Washington Square Village and uh, Coles and the four buildings that are there. Uh, and uh, we brought through uh, an 18 month process that is called ULERP, uh, a request based upon our projected need over a 25 year period for additional space for various uses, uh, academic and otherwise, uh, a request for uh, a rezoning of, of, of that space or the creation of a zoning envelope in that space, which would allow, uh, in aggregate, uh, a little less than 2 million square feet of uh, additional space. Uh, from the university standpoint, this is important. It's, it's, it's part of our attempt to plan for the future. So it's very important that folks understand that, that we uh, we took the plans that had been submitted for, by the various schools and academic units, by your student government, by the departments of the university, uh, by administrative units, uh, and, and we tried to project what we would need over that 25-year period. Um, and uh, if you include the entire complex of needs from the university, 
it, it, it comes to a, a total of about 6 million square feet. Uh, that we would still be considerably more compressed than any of our peer universities. For example, we would end the process if we were able to carry that off over a 25-year period with less land, uh, less, less uh, space uh, on a per capita basis that Columbia has before its expansion. Uh, we, we are respectful of the village and want to be respectful of the, the community here. So uh, we tried to go through a secondary examination and about uh, uh, how much of that space had to be in the core. So, for example, space for community students. Uh, obviously, it couldn't be put out in Brooklyn. That would be ironic. You know, send them out to a class in Brooklyn to, uh, or uh, uh, additional classroom space where students have to move between classes, the departmental offices that go with that for new programs. Uh, and we concluded and made the case successfully, and it was with regard to this segment of the overall 6 million square feet that the case went to the City Planning Commission and to the uh, City Council, a case I should say which was endorsed by all of the major newspapers in town after examining it and listening to all sides of the contentions involved. And the City Planning Commission and then the City Council by a vote of 44 to 1 approved that. That is a, a great um, uh, victory for the university. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's land we already own, and as a result, whatever we build on it is less expensive than if we had to go out, as we have been doing, and buy land in the village and build or uh, buy a building and then renovate that building. And the savings is about $300 a square foot because it costs about $300 just to buy the land uh, in this part of town before you build anything. Or that cost is built into the, the a building if you buy it. Uh, so uh, that would be, if the entire project were done, about a $600 million savings. And that's the key thing to keep in mind uh, as you uh, as you assess, you know, the consequences of, you know, if, if we do this, you know, what's its effect on tuition? Would be? What's the effect on tuition would be $600 million less than it would be if we built uh, the project on land. We didn't know. It's, it's, it's that simple. I mean, it, it, there's no complexity about that. It's a very simple thing. It's cheaper to build a land you want. If you don't own it, you have to buy it before you build it. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is a space planning commission or committee now, uh, which has student representation on it. We'll probably get to discuss some of that later on, uh, which is considering uh, what we do as our first move. The first move will not be on the northern blocks. The first move under our agreement with the city uh, will be on the southern blocks, so where Coles is and where the existing buildings are. And it'll be on one of the two footprints that presently exists, either the Coles footprint or the supermarket. So that's what's been approved, either a building to the east or a building to the west on those footprints. And that would be the first project. And the extent of that first project, and which we do first, and all of that is what's before the uh, Space Planning Committee, which is a university committee, which we, we hope to hear soon. The lawsuit that was brought, as I say, was not against us. We were joined as a necessary party, because we have, obviously, an interest in it. So that's what the lawyers call it. We were joined as a as a necessary party. But the lawsuit is what's called an Article 78 proceeding, which is brought against the city agencies that uh, 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 approved the plan. Uh, after, uh, you know, literally a pile about this high of, uh, of evidence was submitted by all, all the interested parties. Uh, I, I think meticulous care was taken both by the City Planning Commission and by the City Council and by us in going through the process. I think every T was crossed and every I was dotted. You can't ever say anything with certainty about a lawsuit, especially at the earlier stages, but you know, I was the dean of law school. I do this stuff, I did once do this stuff for a living, and I'm very confident that uh, we will win. Now the, the lawsuit can go on for a long time. Uh, because parties can 
it goes through various levels of discovery and so forth uh, as they go through that. And uh, you know, we'll be patient and we'll wait. But I think uh, sooner or later, the lawsuit will will uh, will uh, end up in vindication of what the commission did and what uh, what the city council did there. There is a litigation strategy that lawyers sometimes use when, uh, most usually when the case isn't very strong, and that is uh, kind of public relations, uh, scorched earth, you know, inflict as much pain as you can. Uh, and there's some evidence that that's going on, which you're probably aware. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was raised to that uh, suffering pain for a good cause is a good thing. So I don't think that will succeed either in pointing our efforts. Any follow-up on that question? So prediction, if you want a prediction, I feel much more uh, confident about this than I do about any predictions I would make about the baseball. Uh, uh, is, uh, two lawsuits, uh, both of which will end in vindication of the process and at some point that the building to go forward. Uh, it's, it's a shame we can't begin because the space is needed for all kinds of activities here on campus, but uh, we, we are going to be here for several hundred more years, so we'll wait. And it was never done for the gratification. This is a long range plan. Okay, great. The second question comes from the Global Net Network University category from Kenneth. Um, if Kenneth is here, I would like to ask the question. You can come, feel free to come to the mic. Yes. Right, right. Uh, so you clearly have a vision for the Global Network University. Um, really? Clearly. <laughs> <You noticed. laughs> uh, personally, I have no problems with it. I think it's extremely visionary, but um, and I think that's probably how education at universities is going to proceed for the next 50 or so years. Um, I was wondering what specifically your mission is and how it's going to positively or negatively affect the value of our diplomas after we graduate um, to have be part of this. It's a great question. Um, first, let me make it clear that uh, the, the, the Global Network University, uh, as, as we can see, that, uh, is, is a work in progress. I, th I think it's fair to say that uh, the strategic vision has been mapped, and we've tried to do the technical underpinnings that are necessary to make it work so that people can use it as a tool. And we're now at a stage where, uh, especially for undergraduates here at NYU, it's, it's reasonably easy to circulate the, through the system. Uh, but I would say even uh, in that regard, uh, uh, 100 units of what the global network will be 10 years from now. Uh, in terms of the ease of circulation, its power as a tool for students, undergraduate as well as graduate <coughs> students, uh, we're probably somewhere you know, in the mid 30s, maybe the mid 40s, but there's a lot of work to be done. And we've constituted a university wide committee faculty to work on it, and each of the schools is working on it. U.S. students should be involved in conversations in your schools. Uh, and, and here, of course, but, but most of the, the academic uh, work and shaping will go on in schools and the departments and the units of, of, of the global network. Uh, um, and of course, we have to think of the global network as having three doorways, you know, as uh, Abu Dhabi is now a doorway, and as of next September, Shanghai will be a doorway. Um, so you have to begin to think of yourself as part of a student body that uh, that encompasses students that enter through those doorways. They could be from anywhere in the world, just as a student could enter here from anywhere in the world. And they'll begin to appear here in your classes uh, with, with you. As the, there are students here from Abu Dhabi this year that I know some of you have gotten to know. And, you know, uh, beginning in two years, there'll be students from Shanghai, and it'd be kind of add even to the experience here if you never leave Washington Square. Uh, the, um, I, I think um, 
the, 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 the shaping ultimately on the skeleton that exists with the three doorways and you know the 15 sites, if you include New York as a site, because it's a study away, remember, from the top of China. Uh, uh, and that skeleton is probably set. You know, it, it, there's a fairly strong presumption at this point against uh, building additional uh, uh, components in that skeleton. I've said in previous meetings, you know, one could make a case for a study away site in India. Uh, one could make a case for a study away site in Brazil. Those, uh, one could make a case for maybe an additional site in Africa. Those three cases could be made. They'll be made on the academic merits. Uh, my guess, the guess is it's almost certain it's not going to happen within the next two years or three years, but I wouldn't say it's not going to happen in the next 10 years. That'll be for the academic community uh, to, 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 to uh, develop. And, and the idea here now, now, I think, is to deepen the quality to, to bring graduate professional schools into it. For example, the lawyer school is just beginning to use the Global Network University as a graduate professional school. Uh, many of the departments, of course, uh, have been in the Global Network University for graduate students for a while, but I think that will become more robust. Now, on the specific point you asked about, you know, what does it do to our degree? Um, and the, the, the evidence is pretty overwhelming at this point. This is, this is going to be really good for your degree. Uh, uh, the, the, the college board tracks the interest of students uh, in particular colleges and universities. Uh, and uh, this year, uh, for the first time, with students outside the United States, the number one school in which they were interested, not Harvard, not Yale, not Princeton, NYU. Uh, and uh, in China, First time in history, not Harvard, not Yale, not, not Princeton, NYU. Uh, and, and, that, and by the way, in China, that is uh, almost accepting NYU Shanghai. Because you might say, oh, well, of course there's interest in China, because NYU Shanghai is opening. And, uh, and, and, and half the students in the entering class in NYU Shanghai are going to be Chinese. Oh, that, that doesn't explain it, because those NYU Shanghai students don't take the SAT. They, they're all taking the Yale Cal exam. Uh, so, so they're not. So, if you add them, the, the knowledge about NYU is 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 just increasing, and that's a student measure. But you know, it, this is a world with where, where that student measure is 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 a good measure of you know what do people think of the school. Uh, so, uh, yeah, ninety-seven percent of the people that are going to graduate from high school this country. June will graduate from high schools outside the United States. 12 million will graduate in China. Uh, and, and this is going to be a world in which it's going to matter to you as an NYU New York student what, what those students today have as their awareness of NYU when 10 years from now, 15 years from now, they're the people that you're doing your business with and so forth. And, and what we're doing is being recognized as being very high quality. There are a lot of, I, I'm very skeptical about rankings in general, and I'm not going to say that this particular one I'm going to invoke right now is, is without flaws, but it's, it's significant in the following way, relevant to your question. Uh, the uh, Times of London Higher Education Division does a, a polling where they poll higher education experts around the world, and they ask them to list the top universities in the world. And uh, their most recent uh, uh, rankings, results of that survey, which is only, they, they invite the people in, the higher education experts. And their most recent uh, uh, edition, this is out uh, about a month ago, I think, maybe three weeks ago. And they had called me in January to tell me it was coming out. They've done it the last four years. They started it four years ago. And a four-year span, uh, we, we, in, in a world where if you think about this for a second, uh, you're polling the same group of experts and you're polling about something that's static. This isn't about basketball, or, you know, uh, a stock uh, with the latest report. This is about higher education, where the institutions have been around and producing graduates for generations and centuries. And uh, four years ago, when they first started doing the survey, we were 51st. 
And uh, in this year's survey, we're 29th in the world. Uh, and no other university is moving at the top like that. Everybody else is standing. Who's number one? Uh, I forget who number one is, but it's uh, the, the top four or five or six at a uh, uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, not necessarily in this order, but Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Oxford, and Cambridge, I think. I, I, I think that's the six, and they kind of cluster, you know, and they're on everybody's list, you know, and it, but the point is we're making our move. And it's a fairly dramatic move, so dramatic they called and said, uh, you know, we have to talk to you about what, what explains this. Our theory, they said, is it's the Global Network University. And I said, that's not the only explanation. It, it is that, because we're a presence. But it's also the fact that our faculty, more and more, is among the lead faculty in, in, in the world, and they're attracting students that are among the lead students in the world. When students turn down other places to come to us, as you increasingly do, uh, uh, or faculty leave other places to come to us, that's part of this creation of value in your degree. And I can tell you, having been in a very employment-sensitive environment before I took this assignment, where I was dean of law school, and, and we, we had to monitor how we were perceived by the top law firms and so forth and so on, when you increase like this, and the law school made a similar move in the 90s, where no one would have put it in the top 15, but by the end of the 90s, it was it was reasonable to think of it as the top five law school that everybody did, really. And this morning, uh, when I met with the law school committee about the choice of their next dean, the head of Cravath, Swain and Moore, which is one of the top law firms in the world, uh, said, uh, and his judgment now, most people thought it, well, he was the best law school in the world. So, Pretty good, pretty good, good for employment. That's the value of the degree. So uh, I, I, th I think it's, it, the, the start people would say this is building brand, and I think that's, there's a lot of evidence that's going on. Okay. Um, the next question comes from the category academic. Excuse me one second, before, just before I leave that. You have a lot to do with that, you know. You know, we all have an interest in NYU's uh, uh, perception in the world. We want that perception to be real, okay? We're not embarrassed by who we are. If any of you have seen me interrupt any of the admissions tours, I say we are cacophony, we are complexity, we we don't give you easy community, but if you if you learn to find it here, you'll find it anywhere. We don't give you retreat space, we, we don't have a campus. We're very comfortable in that skin, okay? But, you know, this we, we sometimes denigrate ourselves and don't realize the cost of that terms of exactly what you're talking about, especially if it's done incessantly and over time. We, we, we should realize the fact that that's, that's we, sh we should all, I'm not saying present a false picture, but let's not ignore the things that are going on here. Thank you, Ken. Um, the next question. Like a student government, for example. Thanks, John. <laughs> uh, like you're supposed to say, or the president, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I was fishing for a compliment. Next time. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the next question comes from Joy Sanford. I don't know if you're here. Joy, I like this. Okay, Joy. Do you, would you like to ask him? Okay. We just Um. My name is Joy Sanford. I'm a sophomore at the Clyde Davis Department. I really just wanted to know, well, while you were talking, I was thinking, like, and I guess you explained it, it's for building a brand, but why are you building more of NYU? And I ask that mostly because I know that's expensive, and I am among a number of students who don't, who are really underprivileged and can't afford to be at NYU, so I'm just wondering, like, if all that money is going to a new campus or more of a campus, what about the students who are struggling to be here? Why isn't there scholarship money for students like me? And why is that money going to a new campus? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. And, you know, I, I as recently as a few hours ago, was asking a person uh, for what would be if it happens. And you can think back to this moment, Joy. You know, if it, if we announce it, and you hear the words, the largest gift in the, in the history of higher education, uh, 
remember that it was this and then test what I'm about to say because when he said to me, what would you use it for? I said financially. Uh, and that's where I am every day. Now, he'll, the donor decides, and my prediction is when we announce that gift, as I hope we will, that it will be at least in large part. I define large part as 70%, 75% for financial aid, and that'll give us a help. Uh, it's worth noting some facts, uh, and uh, there's a fact sheet that's going around, I think, to all of you. I gave a copy of it to Melina uh, as we started this meeting. Uh, the, uh, our, our financial aid has uh, consumes a significantly higher percentage of the university's overall budget, so that's exactly the question you're asking about trade-offs. Uh, it, 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 it consumes a significantly higher percentage of the university's uh, expense budget than uh, it did 10 years ago. So that number has been moving in the right direction. Our financial aid has increased considerably more than our tuition has increased. Uh, so again, that shows a reflection that this is a, a very high priority. Now, one of the things that's happened at the same time, this is all on this fact sheet that will be around you. If you don't get it and you want it, just email me and say, John, I've got the fact sheet and I'll send it to you. Uh, but uh, wait till the end of the week because sometimes it takes time for emails to work through the system. But uh, uh, one of the things you'll see is that uh, the percentage of our student body who qualify as, as poor students for financial aid, the Pell Grant eligible students being probably the best measure of that, has also increased over the last 10 years, uh, as, as has the percentage of our minority students substantially increased over the last 10 years. So these are all things in which we're very proud, but that puts more pressure on the dollars that exist for financial aid when you have one needy students from among whom you have to distribute. So in the individual case, we're, it, it, it doesn't feel as dramatic as the numbers will reveal to you that it is. Now, uh, in the end, it doesn't make sense, even if we get financial aid right, to, uh, to, to, to pay tuition beyond what you could get. A student like you could get a merit scholarship to another place, or you could go to a far less expensive place, even if we do give you fairly generous financial aid. The reason to come here is because there's a quality here in the degree, this gets back to the other question, that's, that's worth that to you. And, and, and that's why it's important that we, uh, first of all, attract other really strong students, that we attract uh, other uh, faculty here who are really outstanding, who are going to spend time with you, uh, that, that we have facilities, labs, for example. You take just one example. Uh, you know, Ten years ago, the field of genomics didn't exist. Uh, uh, genomics existed. We didn't have plant genomics at all. We now have this wonderful facility on Waverly, state of the art, uh, filled with people, faculty, students working on plant genomics. Uh, uh, you, you need labs for that. You need faculty for that. You need students for that. Uh, uh, when you see this fact sheet, I want you to notice the tremendous growth in the size of the faculty. Yeah, that's a pro-student move. That brings down faculty-student ratio. That makes more classes available. And that's full-time back. And, to, just to anticipate what people say, well, yes, but how many of them are tenured and tenure track? Look at the facts on the tremendous increase that's occurred here in the tenured and tenure track faculty. Just the numbers of tenured and tenure track faculty. Uh, so all of these things are, are done, and you have the balance you know, and when you, if, you, if you bring in additional faculty, you need additional office space for them. You need additional, additional classrooms for the classes you've added. You need additional faculty housing in the case of, uh, of, of our university because it's hard to recruit student faculty here from New Haven or from Princeton or from, uh, let alone Vanderbilt or places like that, uh, if we don't provide them with, with housing of the sort that uh, we're able to provide them in places like you know, Washington Square Village, Silver Towers, and so on. Uh, so uh, it, it, it becomes a, a, a delicate balance, but what I'm saying to you is that if you look at the, the, the actual numbers, you'll find that 
the Herculean effort has been in the area of financial aid. Still far from adequate, which is why I made the ask today that I did. And, uh, you know, we, that ask could come in and 10 more like it, and we still wouldn't be at my level of satisfaction, quite frankly. Now, uh, just to take one part of your question on which there's an awful lot of misunderstanding, and I just want to be direct about this, and if you want to ask a follow-up question, you can ask a follow-up question. Um, you should understand that, that, you know, that all this word about expansion, 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 expansion. Look, we are a thought community here. I'm going to ask you to do things. I'm going to ask you to think. Okay, start with the fact sheet, but think. Don't just stop at, uh, you know, whatever number of carrots it is you, you, you do when you do Twitter. Go to the second level, the third level, the fourth level. Don't stop at some slogan that somebody gives you. Okay, find out what the facts are and push your way down. I, I've been a little bit disappointed in uh, the willingness of, of the community in discussing some of these issues to, to push down in levels of arguments beyond slogans. And uh, this is the example I'm going to give you. I'm going to take your, 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 your question. So um, expansion, expansion, expansion. Well, if I use the word decompression, 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 there's a different feel to it. All you have to do is try to get an elevator at noon in so, in so. Okay? Anybody that's had that experience understands we need space. Any commuter student understands we need space. Okay? That's a reality of, 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 of this place. Um, I will tell you a tremendously important thing in attracting quality students to be the classmates, to make the expenditure, even after financial aid, of what you do here. You attract those quality students and quality faculty and quality administrators is the quality of our gym. We have a 40 year old un air conditioned gym. Now, I'm not looking to build something like they have at Duke. I'm not talking about climbing walls. I'm saying that you know we either create a better facility in that gym or 10 years from now it's going to be so dowdy and so uh, behind standing yards, students will want to come here because. That they're, they're conscious, and by the way, it's not good for wellness if the students aren't between class able to get to a gym or the faculty aren't able to get there. And that drives up your health costs because we're a self insured health system. So, so, I mean, all this gets very matrixed and complex, uh, but we are deeply compressed. And the plan. The so-called 2031 plan, or the Sexton plan, or whatever you want to call it, posits a 0.5 percent growth in the student body. 0.5 percent, not 5 percent, 0.5 percent growth in the student body. Whereas the city of New York is positing a 2.5 percent growth in college and university students in the city during that time. Every other university in the city is positing more growth than we are in the student body, and to posit less than 0.5 percent would be to say, okay, if we're going to bring plant genomics on board, or we're going to start uh, this uh, Center for Urban Sustainability and Progress to be the place to study the future cities, then for every student we add, we've got to eliminate a program. So you've got to allow some growth to allow for disciplines that didn't or don't exist. So uh, believe me, we are not expanding. Our, now, we, are going, we do project to expand the faculty population. Because we want to improve the faculty student ratio. Okay, so, so uh, but, but the, the quote expansion, 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 this is not out of some edifice complex. Believe me, you're looking at the one person who can have a clean conscience on this. Because none of these buildings are going to be completed during my time as president. You know, this is planting a tree under which others will sit. You know, I'm willing to take the hit, the pain, the opprobrium, the vilification, all this stuff that's going on, largely through slogan and lack of information, or say to people, there's no business plan. It's going to drive the students farther into debt because tuition is going to rise because of this. There's one answer to that. I gave it already. Okay? It costs less to build the land. 
land you own and land you don't own. Whatever we do, whatever we as a community decide to do, will cost less than if we don't do it then. Period. End of case. Now, uh, if you want to say we should do nothing, that we should stay in the end of what we are now, we shouldn't do it, you know, then you have to accept the consequences of that. And you know the con you know how we're bursting into the scene. Just take, and it's the last thing I'll say on this, and then you'll see the connection, I think. A university our size on best practices should have 9,000 seats for students to study in its library. We have 3,000. You want to know why you can't find a seat in the library to study? That's your answer. So if you build more space for students to study without increasing the size of the student body, you've taken a step towards solving that. And that makes for a better degree, a better experience, and so forth and so on. So that, but financial aid is right there on the front. It can't be the only expenditure. But believe me, at least as long as I'm here, and I'm here for several more years, it's going to be the number one priority. So that, that's so, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I want to make it very, very clear. Every time I use the word financial aid for the last 15 minutes in this conversation today, I meant grants. I am not talk talking about loans. Okay, I'm talking about grants. John, can you talk about the proceeds from your book? Where are they going? The proceeds, well, uh, so I got this book. <laughs> uh, it's a plug. It's a plug for you. Okay. Now, I, uh, uh, the book wouldn't have gotten done if it hadn't been for a student named Peter Schwartz, who was in the first class to uh, take the course with me 11 years ago, uh, and a man named Tom Oliphant, who is, uh, was the White House correspondent for the Boston Globe. Uh, so uh, when we uh, when we uh, decided we would try to do the book, which is, it's all, it's, 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 I think they would agree, it's, it all comes from my heart, my soul, my course, my stories. Uh, there's some, I, I won't say, it wouldn't have gotten done without that. But the methodology we used started with me talking into a tape recorder and then taking it and bringing it back and so forth. And, and uh, I said to them, I, I wanted them on the cover, which they are on the cover. It's uh, what does it say? John Sexton with Tom Oliphant and Peter Schwartz, and uh, the proceeds, whatever we get. Of course, the publisher gets most, but whatever we get goes a third, a third, a third. My share goes to financial aid. Uh, so uh, I mean, I uh, you, you know you get into what people do. Uh, as, as you know, I think I matched the 1831 fund, and this will go to financial aid. I'm doing whatever. And that gives me a little authority with uh, a donor. Right? When I say, you know, this is what I'm doing. If you have any other questions about like financial aid or anything like that, I will say that like, and on student government, we talk about this topic a lot. We work on, as John mentioned, the 1831 fund, which is a campaign for students by students um, to help alleviate the issues. We know we can't solve the problem, but we um, raise money. Um, the hope is that by your senior year, you'll donate $18.31 um, to this fund. Um, it's matched by John. It's matched by another trustee. It's like you're giving $56 towards scholarships for incoming freshmen. Um, so th and there are other things going on, Joy, if you want to talk afterwards, um, or if you want to grab any of our business cards on the way out, we're happy to talk about this and any other um, things on your mind. Uh, so the next question comes from the Student Life um, section. Um, it's from Jason Lindy. Do you want to ask it? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. You better read it. It's pretty bad, right? Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. Come on, come on up to the mic. Can you read it? I got it. I think I remember. Go to the mic, though, because right. you are reading straight to the world. Oh, cool. So, hi. My name's Jason. Um, I brought up this question a couple times with the student senators and also with Ted for the subcommittees for 2031. So my question... Ted, Ted is the, the Professor Ted Magner from Steinman, who's the chair, chair of that committee. He's oh, really, done really tremendous really work on it. Yeah. So, 
Um, first, I'd like to say how great it is, I think, that there are subgroups that are working on it that are a coalition of students and faculty. I think that's a great way to move forward um, when you're planning and explaining um, how to work forward. But the 2031 plan as it is right now is set within the framework of physical space. You're considering when you're expanding how you're physically going to move real estate, make more rooms and spaces like that. My question, and my question has been to Ted, is what plans does NYU have for um, what I and some other planners call soft expansion, which is where you have big partner, partnership with businesses that are um, close to NYU that NYU students take advantage of to make them easier to access. For example, um, you could give the example of Shakespeare & Co., a place that almost completely relies on NYU students. Um, how is NYU planning as it expands to work with these facilities that is the reason so many students come to the school. You know, this is New York City. Um, and how, it, how can we as students get involved with that process? Okay, so stay at the mic, because I'm, I, I'm going to try to answer your question. I'm going to be relatively brief, but I, I, if I don't get it right, I'm not going to be uh, First of all, th this comes back to the that I made before about informing yourself and, and not thinking in slogans, uh, but, but actually getting the, 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 the beyond the slogans to the actual realities, and then putting yourself in a position of trying to make the right decision for the common wheel, trying to rise above uh, just the one window you're given. This is a theme of the global network universe. Look at it through the many facets of the diamond. And try to find the, the 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 truth that the wisdom of all the perspectives provides. The space planning group is a perfect example of that. The, 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 that whole process is utterly and completely transparent to you. Uh, if you go on their website, I'm sure you've done this, and you can give testimony to this if I'm wrong, even in a scintilla. You go on their website, you will find everything. That the committee is, is, is delivering on. I mean, literally dozens of sub websites that can lead you to just about any answer to any question at any level of depth you want. Is that a fair characterization? It is up until a certain point. We have about 30 or so students who are together right now. We um, are, you know, we're in pretty positive conversations with Ted and those folks. Um, and what we're trying to do is say, we together want to work with faculty to try and find ways of making a 2031 plan that is um, that makes students more accessible to the business partnerships. Well, so I get the specific question you're right. making. I'm just, I'm just trying to say to people, there's loads of information. There's there. lots of information out there. They can bring um, anything that they want. When, but when it comes to participation. Yeah, so now I want to get to that. that I want to get to that point. So the, the content, which is where you're going, you know, right. the actual what goes in to, to the building. Uh, is is at this point uh, in two different kinds of information. You, you have essentially crystallized requests that have come from the community. And I want to emphasize this: this is not something that was made up by uh, the senior cohort of the university. These this space assessment was done by the plans, the academic plans that came in from the departments, the units, and the schools. And you know, there are all kinds of strange things in this process. In the same mail, the same day, I received uh, a petition from a department at this university, I'm not going to name it because it's embarrassing what I'm about to tell you, that uh, indicated opposition to the space 2031 plan and a request for 30,000 square feet of additional space. Two different envelopes, same days, you know, uh, both coming from the same department. So you, you, know, you just can't run a railroad this way. I mean, this is not, but so, so the needs were identified by those re requests. And then it wasn't that every need was accepted. The provost then vetted those needs and said, you know, within the envelope of our prior He's giving financial aid, first priority, faculty, the second priority, and so forth. The board had said to us, this comes back in a way, Jordan, to your question, that, that they 
wanted us to operate in an envelope where 7% of the budget was spent on capital. 7%. That they thought going below that meant we would never have enough space or we would do what frequently nonprofits do and frankly what had been done before 2001 here was defer maintenance, which is ultimately a losing situation. Okay, so they said, you know, just put that in a lockbox, okay, and, and, and use that. And in fact, we've been doing, uh, for the last 10 years, and again, this is on this fact sheet. You can go to the fact sheet that's coming around today. Because I just decided, you, you people should just have in a simple form some of the basic facts that just keep, uh, it, it seems to me, being ignored. So over the last 10 years, that's not it, by the way. It's, it's, it's a big, thick thing. That, uh, it's pretty big. Yeah, it's, it's like this thick, and it's got all kinds of things in it. But, We've been doing 300,000 square feet a year in new space. That doesn't even count the renovated space we've been doing. Because we did a complete renovation of the campus, much of the campus, not all of the campus, but much of the campus over the last 10 years. And we've been able to do that 300,000 square feet. Now, if you do 300,000 square feet over 25 years, it's more than 6 million square feet. And we've been able to do it within that budget envelope, even while catching up with deferred maintenance. So my hope is we'll be actually have money left over to go to other services. Now, whether the particular uh, use, substantive use that, that you're advocating, which means synergistic work with industries and so forth, if I'm understanding you correctly, gets incorporated in that space, is going to depend upon the case that's made. This, now, if we don't have the space, we're not even at the case made for it level. Okay, but but if we have the space, then it will be well. Okay, is it the Institute for Performing Arts for Tish, which is you know on the front burner right now, and Tish is saying its survival depends upon having a theater that operates like a Broadway theater. Skirball does not; it doesn't have enough wing space, fly space, whatever. Or is it that? <laughs> yeah, but and now the last thing I want to say is there's a lot of what you're describing going on in Brooklyn. Okay, and the Poly campus, where there's a much more natural synergy uh, with innovation and startups and things of that sort, and, and we're taking the kind of Silicon Alley philosophy, and that, that's something we're very consciously building out in Brooklyn. Why? Because there already was, right in Dumbo, a very vibrant community of the thought that I think you're describing. So why would we try to recreate that in Greenwich Village where those places can't afford to be? When we can do when we're right there in Brooklyn. So we're building it out there, and Frank Rolowski and his team are doing a lot with that. And I'm sure you're aware of that. So Frank is actually a great example. Um, and what I think that I'm trying to um, explain is that in addition to the explicit land that NYU has, the square footage that we have, there's a lot of implicit land that students take advantage of, additional square Sorry, feet of footage that occurs in theater. Like I use the Wari restaurant. Exactly, as well. uh, yeah, punch gym. You know, lots of different things um, for financial and students um, working with the businesses down the street. Got it. So my question really is about, you know, you have this expansion that's happening in the physical landscape where you're buying more land, right? Um, decompression. But in addition, um, there's a lot of spaces that are square footage that students take advantage of um, that are about. New York City, and a lot of the reason I came to NYU is because of that. Right, and therefore? And therefore, because I mean, we, because Shakespeare and Company already is there. Right, so my question well, is, is already there. Is that when we, me and these 30 or so students go up and we talk to Ted and we're like, where within these subcommittees can we as students try to have as part of this plan how students can more easily take advantage and be a part of this implicit additional square footage, yeah. where is this a part of the plan? How can we get involved? The answer that we've gotten is so far, the structure of the subcommittees does not have right. some... So let me, I'm, I'm, Go gonna, I'm gonna try to be your ally here. I, I think, you, you know, there's a, <laughs> an issue called jurisdiction. I think you're arguing the wrong court. It, it's, it's, it's like taking a, a contract case to a bankruptcy court. Right. You know, the, the, the space planning committee doesn't have jurisdiction over everything to do with space. It's, it, it's got to do with how we utilize the particular uh, envelope of space given to us 
through the EULA process on the, uh, uh, the, the super blocks and specifically what our first move will be. So um, I think you would be doing your cause, if I understand it correctly, and I think I do now, a disservice by trying to argue, for example, against the Tissue Student Performing Arts oh, or, absolutely. Or, or, or against the uh, Student Computer Space. I think where you should go is to the uh, Community Relations Committee of the Senate and to Lynn Brown. Lynn Brown. Lynn Brown is the Senior Vice President for External Relations, and I think Arthur Tannenbaum is the chair uh, of the community. He's a faculty member, library faculty member, a very good man. And, and you want to make your case to them that we can do various programmatic things, if I'm understanding you correctly, to capture this free good that's out there and enhance it. And I'm all with you on that. I buy, I buy that. But I think you're making it. What Ted is saying to you, uh, without the legal jargon I just used, is you're in the wrong court. Right. So um, I guess as you. And you we did give the answer, which is Lynn Brown and these people. Our question was, who can we talk to? Because yeah. we do believe that um, community relations is I, a huge part of yeah. how we plan. I agree with you. Agree with you completely. Absolutely. I agree. Now, you know, uh, uh, I, you don't know where particular elements of the community are at this moment in terms of their desire to march over to the sunset with mm -hmm. you with the music rising and everybody happy. Uh, uh, there, there, uh, I've changed the restaurant that I use for uh, my, my morning meetings uh, from a restaurant that, that I used to love to use that the, for some gratuitous reason decided that our building plan was bad for them to a restaurant that supported it. And uh, uh, we don't use this hotel rather than that hotel for the same, same reason. You know, why should we give people business that they're going to use the proceeds to sue us? So uh, the the uh, uh, so so uh, you know we might not be at the most propitious time with every company you'd like to connect to. On the other hand, I can give you a list of a hundred that are in the neighborhood that are just absolutely delighted to have us here and would like to be involved in an enhancement program. So I think I've been standing up here for a while. My final sentence would just be: How do you feel that with these two different groups, Ted and Lynn, there might be some kind of incorporation with community relations as part of the plan? And you think there might be a formal process to make community relationships a part of how 2031 moves forward? I think the space planning committee, which is a group of volunteers, feel they have worked really, really hard. They've taken a lot of unjustified abuse. Absolutely. People have invited to talk to them, refused to talk to them, and then criticized them for not talking to them. Uh, you know, and I think asking them to do yet another job is probably not the right way. You always know where you're. So I'm saying to you, I go in a separate, parallel path, okay. and and because the space planning committee is going to go out of existence at some point, whereas the uh, community relations office that Lynn runs is going to stay. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for your interest. Great. Thanks. The next question comes from the category Global Network University. <clears throat> Um, questions from Amanda McLaughlin. She's here. Would you like to ask a question? Hello, Amanda. My question is, how is it planning, are you planning to use new technologies to improve the quality of learning across the global network? This, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a man, uh, and you have ideas, Amanda, or anyone else in the room, I'm going to encourage you to communicate with him. There's a man named Rick Matazar. Richard is his name. I don't know whether it's Richard.Matazar or Rick.Matazar, but the last name is M-A-T-A-S-A-R. He's an extraordinarily innovative man. I've known him for about uh, 25 years. He's extremely creative. And, and he is driving for us the overall strategic question that you ask and any ideas that you have, uh, uh, I, I know we will appreciate and get in dialogue with you about it. There's a lot of thought going on precisely on the question. First of all, NYU is unbelievably active in this domain in ways that it would be very easy in this place to miss. You know, 
with all the publicity and like books and so forth and so on. We were actually there early and we're very active. Is there anybody here from Polly? Yeah, well, Polly uh, was, 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 was named recently, I think, the fourth best in using technology in the country. I mean, including places like MIT and Stanford and so forth and so on, uh, and, and using it for things like online learning and enhancing the classroom experience and so forth. Uh, this is, uh, I, I like the way you posed the question because you said, how is it going to enhance learning on this campus? And uh, in a way, Joy, this gets back to the earlier question in very interesting ways because uh, uh, the better the education, the better the view of us, because you can make up stuff that gives people a positive view of you for a little while, but it doesn't last for a long time. Okay, and especially if you're trying to make a position to move, which is what NYU is constantly trying to do, we're, we're, and we're pretty good at making a position to move. Uh, so if we can enhance the, the learning through the use of technology, if we can take advantage of a unique asset we have, and I use that word unique in the literal sense, we are the only university that has this network of campuses around the world that could be connected. So you could imagine a course on cities, for example, where students at our sites around the world uh, could, uh, could, could, could be in, in class together. And we've already built, and by the way, so, you know, sometimes people ask, uh, you know, well, what's in, in it, what's, what's, what's in it for me in the NYU Abu Dhabi experience? Well, we have never asked Abu Dhabi to do anything that we wouldn't do or that we couldn't justify to them, that we wouldn't do if we were in their position and they knew all the facts, or we couldn't justify to them as enhancing NYU Abu Dhabi's position. But a lot of times, by enhancing NYU Abu Dhabi's position, you enhance, as a kind of free ride, New York. So one of the most obvious things is, uh, you know, we have common courses in the university. So let's say the common courses are a unit of 100. And now, in fact, uh, under, by bringing in very talented people, with a broad perspective, like Jack Lou when he was here, and then Mike Alfano who followed him, we were able to cut uh, about 20% of the cost of the university administration, not in the schools, the university administration, the savings of $60 million a year, every year. So 60 times 20, because you're spending it down at 5%. Uh, 60 times 20, it's a $1.2 billion endowment equivalent. That $60 million was then available for other things. And, uh, uh, but the, the, the what, we, what we're doing is, uh, so, so take, take, the unit cost I said was 100, and then I went off into a tangent to say actually we're trying to bring that unit cost of the university down, and Jack and Mike did. But let's fix it at 100. If you have 14 schools contributing to that, they don't all contribute an equal amount. It's usually done by school population. But let's say it's 114. If you bring in two more schools, you bring in Abu Dhabi, you bring in Shanghai, now there's 60. So everybody's contributing 116th of that course. That's a kind of obvious way that Abu Dhabi helps. But a less obvious way, relevant to your question, is if you go over to 19 Washington Square West, or you go to my office, or various spots around this campus, we now have the capacity to do telepresence here and there, uh, and it'll open in Shanghai in September, and in some of the study away sites the year after that. And all of that is being funded by Abu Dhabi, because it's a good thing for Abu Dhabi. They want the network, so they were willing to pay for that, and it's a free good for us. So, so uh, uh, that's another way in answering your question we've been trying to enhance. We've, we've, we're putting a lot of effort into with professors that want to step forward to enhance their courses. We now have experts that can work side by side with them. And we built that capacity. We just brought on 17 additional people to work with uh, faculty in building technology into enhancing their, their, their courses. So uh, Rick Manasaw is the one that's driving all of this. And, uh, and, and in the end, there may be ways to now bring that back home to your question, Joy. 
and say, okay, now is there a way for us to restrain the course of the universe through doing certain things uh, in ways that are not traditional? Maybe some of the uh, basic language courses, you know, I mean, it, this is a lot of literature out on this, and I'm not an expert on it, so I'm not going to speculate on why. It's a decision the faculty will make. And we have set up a faculty committee on technology that parallels the one in the global network in space. Oh. Did you want to mention anything about digitizing the library? Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is why she's the president, and I'm just the guy to be a talk. So, so digitizing the library is another example, right? NYU Abu Dhabi wants our library. They want it to be accessible to the students in Abu Dhabi. So they're funding the digitization of the library. Well, when it's digitized, you can call it up for work, you know, uh, or from your dorm. Uh, so that's another way in which it helps. So, you know, this, this idea out there that, that uh, you know, the Global Network University is increasing course is just counterfactual. It's just contracted effects, period, okay. end of case. Any follow-up for that? No. Uh, next question is from Joanna. I think, I think we have time for maybe, let's say, three more, okay? okay. This is where it is. Yeah, we need a class at six. Yeah. Um, next one's from Joanna Curtis. Here, here. She's a PhD student in the school, uh, Graduate School of Arts and Science. What department? I'm in history. History. Um, I'm curious. There's um, there's an initiative at NYU called the Provost Global Research Initiative that enables PhD students and, and faculty um, to spend some time at some of the global network um, sites. I'm not sure I know all the languages. Um, and honestly, that was one of the things that made me interested in coming here, because um, I'm doing some research involving, um, involving Czechoslovakia. Um, and why you have the center at Prague. And this is very, it's a very personal thing that has to do with my own experience, but it made me sort of wonder about, um, wonder about how the global, um, how the global network has been, has been planned and sort of uh, about some gaps that might exist in it and some things that might be filled in maybe in the coming years. Um, I, I would love to take advantage of this opportunity to do research in Prague, but I recently found out that there isn't even going to be a Czech Intermediate Language course offered in NYU uh, next year. So I won't even be able to acquire the language skills that I would need here in order to be able to go and do that research there. And there's not, there's not summer study offered through the university. It just seems really surprising to me that a lot of money is invested um, in having this location abroad, but for those of us, uh, you made a big point about sort of easy circulation through the global network. Um, but some of us, for our studies, actually need something different. We do need cultural immersion. We do need to kind of do things the hard way. Um, so I'm just wondering what kinds of resources you see um, as being available to, to graduate students and faculty in my position, um, of really needing to, to acquire those hard skills in a detailed way to get our work done. So I'm going to give you a name with which you can follow up with, with, with great detail on this. Um, and that's Katie Fleming. Do you know Katie? Okay. She, okay. She's very close. She's in the history department. She works in the general area uh, of the world that you do, although not Czechoslovakia. Um, the, um, were you here earlier when I spoke about the, the, the Global Network University and gave the scale of 100, then you'll remember that I said it's in the mid-30s or, or, or mid-40s at this point, and that was describing the most advanced component of it, which was the undergraduate education. And I said we were just now beginning, uh, and this will be driven principally, frankly, out of the schools and departments. Okay? Uh, 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 we're just now beginning to uh, make available the, the assets Sets, tools because we now have the, the, the infrastructure built that we could accommodate you. Um, and and there, there are now uh, the, the vice chancellor but who runs the sites, not Abu Dhabi or Shanghai, his name is Linda Mills. Katie is the deputy provost, Linda Mills is the specific vice chancellor of running those sites, is now engaged and has been engaged in the last four or five weeks in what are very detailed conversations with the departments and units about who wants to take uh, uh, the, uh, the ownership of, of 
particular sites. Now, if everybody in the university claims one site, uh, you know, then it's like everybody in the university wanted to teach in one classroom. You know, there'll have to be some allocation made and some planning. But we're involved. That we, what we call this is in, in, in horizon curriculum planning uh, with regard to how to make each of the sites more robust. And one of the obvious connections would be the co concomitant language requirements in each of the sites. You know, language departments and what departments you choose to do uh, in-house as opposed to a part of a consortium and we're part of a large consortium in the metropolitan area. Uh, is a commitment to a department. You can't, you know, uh, you, you, uh, how, how you bring in intermediate check is is uh, is something that has to be worked out at the school level or within FAS in this case, because the language departments and and the departments that would use those language skills, like your yourself, uh, 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 that that's an academic decision that's made on on the local level, and we're only just beginning to make with regard to the Global Network University. But I would say prima facie, I agree with the premise of your point, which is that if we have 16 sites, we ought to be able to provide language instruction for those that want to be immersed deeply in those 16 sites. I'm not the decision maker there, but I find that a very powerful argument. Okay, Linda Mills isn't the decision maker there. Katie Fleming's not the decision maker there. The decision maker there will be the departments within FAS and how they decide to do it. Uh, or it'll be the deans working with the site directors to say, okay, we're not going to build a check department here, but we want the site to have the capacity to uh, build, build this. Uh, so I, I find quite reasonable your point. Now, I, I point out to you, the program is already at the point where you can use the checks. So, so, so I don't want people in the room who are graduate students. Uh, as, as far as I know, it's pretty much uh, available at this point that folks can go. You're bringing up a sub-question, which is very important, which how, is how you develop the language skills to use it the way you want to use it. And I acknowledge the validity of the point. I would urge that you get in touch with Linda Mills and Katie Fleming, and they'll push it forward with the units within FAS as we do this, this, this planning, because this is, you were in the very early stages of this. Um, I would point out to you that if we did not have the Global Network University, we wouldn't even be having a conversation. <laughs> You'd be in, you wouldn't even have the accommodations over there, which you can have thanks to the fact that we have the site there. But uh, that isn't sufficient yet, and I accept that. If you give us your question sheet back, we will follow up with you as well. Um, that goes for anyone that fills out a question. Um, next, we have a question from Student Life. From Samet um, Gaijri. Are you here? Okay. Why has NYU not tried to measure student support for John Sexton? So, oh, and why has NYU not tried to measure? <laughs> <laughs> why has NYU not tried to measure student support for John Sexton? Faculty as a whole make up a fraction of NYU. Surely students should get to put their voice forth and let the president and faculty see our opinion. Because I think that at the end of the day, faculty do drive the university forward. But their presence here is only you know, allowable for students who pay for tuition here as well. And they should know our opinion before, you know, in some classes where they not turning us by saying we want the president to stay where we want it to go. They should know how student, their own students feel that the matter as well. Well, first, I, I hope that faculty aren't using faculty time to talk about how they feel about the president, the university, or anything else. Uh, I find that to be highly irregular. I certainly don't even use my time to say how I feel about me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, look. Um, Running a complex institution is not a popularity contest. Uh, this country uh, has fallen into several broad patterns about which I would like to warn you folks, because you're going to be 
the leaders of this country and the world. I don't know the extent to which the rest of the world has fallen, but I will speak about my own country. And I will say we have fallen into some very deep and troubling patterns. First of all, uh, we don't trust anyone. Uh, my own propensity is never to doubt anybody's goodwill until it's been proven to me by direct evidence. Somebody says something bad to me about somebody else. I've learned something about the person who's doing the speaking, not about the subject of the speaking. And that is that they say bad things about people. That doesn't mean to me that um, they're right or they're wrong about the other person. So I try to start with the proposition that the people with whom I'm dealing are good. Uh, I remember there was a famous incident at the law school when my vice dean came in and he was particularly broken. I could tell. I read his aura. He said, Oscar, it's a matter. He reported a conversation with a faculty member who had been in his face. And I said, now Oscar, you have to take that as a personal growth opportunity. You have to save yourself what is it about this otherwise good person that is causing him to present himself to me in such a bad way? What has happened in his life that I can help adjust him? Oscar looked at me and said, uh, I said, John, don't you understand? And he started with something else. He said, you're such, and I'm not going to use his word, you're such a blippin' Catholic. He says, don't you understand that there are some of us that think that some people are just shits? <laughs> well, I don't think that. Okay, and I have a very strong capacity and, and desire, and I would urge you folks to, 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 to trust people until you learn you can't trust them. Uh, and then um, another thing that's happened in our society is uh, we, we, we value ourselves and our immediate gratification of the world too much. And fewer and fewer people are willing to incur sacrifice or pain to make things better in the future. Now this is strange. This, and I'm talking about the country generally. New Yorkers are generally better at this than others because New York is an immigrant city. Forty percent of our citizens were born elsewhere. And uh, New York is, you know, an immigrant wants a better tomorrow than today. And, and uh, parents tend to do that way in their kids. I'm sure many of you are in that position. But it's not the, the zeitgeist of our society at this point. Uh, so uh, people want immediate gratification, and fewer people still that are willing to look at the woman are willing to make a sacrifice for uh, so sometimes, if you're in a leadership position, uh, what you have to do is not popular. Especially if you're in a meritocratic institution, where if things are being done right, uh, and the agenda of excellence is being pushed forward, you have to say no more often than you have to say yes to people. Uh, and uh, because you're trying to elevate, 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 elevate. Uh, now, uh, the predicate of your question was, you know, one of our faculties, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, you know, I have a PhD in religion, it's faculty where I began, it's the faculty that, you know, is in some ways the heart of the university, but 43% of the faculty in that, in that uh, faculty voted they didn't have confidence in the president of the university, this guy named Sexton. Uh, you, know, you can disaggregate the reasons for it. You can try to explain it. If you're, if you are a person, as I am, who understands she's not perfect, and who understands you're more likely to hear how you can improve from people who are criticizing you, people who are praising you, you listen carefully. And you try to find uh, that which you can do better. 
you have to distinguish that from some people that are maybe manifesting some of the characteristics I've just described. Um, and then you go on. You, you, you know, you, uh, you take comfort from the, the people who write you, and since that uh, vote, uh, thousands of people have written me to say, you know, some of the former students, some of the faculty members, some of the faculty members in MBS, some people outside the university, and it's been nice. It's been kind of very nice to me. Uh, the, the critics don't feel they have to write your message was heard and you reflect on it. But then, you know, uh, the, the medical school and the dental school and uh, the nursing school, their faculties step forward with statements of support when they heard that the was thinking of doing this. It's a, you know, medical school people, their senators stood up at the university sent and said, you know, we're trying to recover from Hurricane Sandy, you know, medical center. Do you understand John is in Washington for us, is with the governor for us, is up here, you know. And that, that was uh, uh, heartening. But, you know, we said, don't, you know, we, we don't want this to be turned into a big popular. This is not a primary, primary campaign. And frankly, I said to your student leaders, just stay out of this. You know, I, I, I don't want to. You, you've never heard a word coming from me criticizing our faculty. No matter what has been said, I have not criticized our faculty. I'm not going to do that. I love our faculty. Uh, now, the, the law school faculty, which knows me best, they said, well, listen, we're not standing by anymore. So they put out a report last week. Apparently they're voting tomorrow. I would predict them probably. They know me. Uh, that's highly reliable evidence, I would say. I'm not a cartoon to them. I'm a person that was their parish priest for 14 years. But I wouldn't want to get students. Yeah, it's not. It, the, the, the nice part of my day, I'm going to confess to you, is I'm stopped, you know, dozens of times a day and ask for a hug. And it's wonderful. I love students. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm the only university person in the world that teaches a full faculty schedule. That's why I got to cut this short. Otherwise, I'd stay with you till midnight. But uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, but look, you know, twenty thousand students are new here every year. They don't have an idea of who John Sexton is. It's one of the reasons I didn't want to do this assignment. I resisted doing this. I don't want to be a cartoon. And, and so I would think it wouldn't be a very good idea to have a, you know, because the, most of the voters would be utterly uninformed. I mean, you, you, you know, we connected for a few minutes here. You don't really know anything about me. I mean, this, probably 90% of the stuff you've heard is untrue. Uh, I'm looking at Kate right now. She has Okay, well, well, you should be. <laughs> Here's, um, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I also think that when you open yourself up, you become more vulnerable, and you're going to, you can open yourself up to more attack. But from the student point of view, and I don't know what this other student will say, my concern is that all I, when I Google it, all I see is the stuff in the media about these dramatic things from this like he said, a very small, slim majority, a minority. So how do we get the message out that okay. the whole university? Okay, so look. Because I think it affects the brand that I, you're talking about. I there think. is, I, I think it is ironic that people that claim that they're acting for the better of the university think that the way to do that is engage in some of the vitriol about the university. And forget me, the university's leadership and uh, and what the university is doing is this, this uh, an obvious irony there. Uh, I'm not going to go beyond that statement. Uh, there are, you can look at this fact sheet. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the, uh, I, I, I am not going to be part of 
get into a public battle with any member of our faculty. I respect my colleagues. I am a faculty member. I've been a faculty member for two years. I try hard to listen to their viewpoints. Uh, you know, uh, this may not be known to you as students, but I have what I call Saturday sessions with faculty. Any faculty member for 12 years could put his or her name in a box or some system and would, would, would Diane you, who was my chief of staff until the last few months. She's now moved on to other things in the university. It's another chief of staff that's running it. An hour and a half, no agenda, eight to ten faculty members, <coughs> talk about anything you want. Uh, I've now logged more than 200 of those Saturday sessions over the last 12 years. I, the, the names that you mentioned have never come to one of the Saturday sessions. Okay. So, uh, look, it's, uh, it's, 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 as you say, it's part of the world. It, it is not, I am, I am a blessed person in the fact that it has very little impact on my happiness. It causes me to reflect, I listen. Uh, I recognize what's not me that's being talked about. I may put that aside, and I try to learn and get better each day. We're, we're all in that. That's what life is about, trying to get better each day. Uh, uh, I just came back from, just before I was here, I was with one of my uh, students, former students. I, I had directed her paper in Gallup on religion and sports. And who knows what's going to happen to an NYU student. It turns out she's got a show on MSNBC in the afternoons. And the publicist for the book and her booker, without either of us knowing, had booked me to appear on her show today. And I show up, and this is my student, my NYU student from six years ago. Uh, and uh, she, or one of the other hosts, you know, it's one of these things where they, it's called The Cycle, the show. And it was, they were peppering me with different questions. And, they said, so what do you learn from baseball? I said, what do you learn from baseball? He said, the best hitter in the history of baseball made out six times out of ten. And, and, and a, a very good hitter makes out seven times out of ten. And that should teach you a little humility if you think you're going to bat a thousand. Okay? You're not going to bat a thousand. Okay? There was one guy that batted a thousand with three major league bats. He never had a fourth bat. It's the only person in the history of baseball ever to bat a thousand. A very small sample. It's not statistically significant. Social science would tell us. <coughs> so um, I've got to try to manage us through this. Uh, the trustees who know me well and the deans who know me well are there. Ask for hugs or offer one. They're always appreciated. Uh, but I don't think it's a good idea. I mean, it's not to get into it. I, I wouldn't care if it was 90% approval, which it wouldn't be, I'm sure. But if, I would never would because it would, wouldn't be a valid. If people would be just it'd be encouraging what I warned against earlier, which is going on something you've heard. Okay, last question. I, got, I really do have to get to my class. More, I have to go home and change to get to my class because I can't teach just like this. You're going to find your Brooklyn College sweatshirt? My Brooklyn Prep sweatshirt. Brooklyn Prep. Not Brooklyn College. Brooklyn. Um, okay, the last question that we have today comes from Nafisa. Um, I don't know if she's still here. Um, okay, I don't think she's here. Um, her question is I have a question regarding the expansion to 20% international students in the coming years. As international students are ineligible for aid, I'm assuming that's financial aid, won't this mean that only those international students that can pay can come? I love that question. Uh, so right now, in New York, we give very little financial aid. I mean, it's almost accurate to say none. To undergraduate students or international students. Some of our graduate schools do. For example, if you're in the doctoral program, uh, you, you would get financial aid. 
uh, I don't know where the professional schools are. And I was deemed a law school. We had not yet matured to the point where we were giving financial aid. But let's just take as a, an accurate statement that there may be some caveats to it, the fact that that's the present undergraduate aid policy, which is, I think, what the question was probably voted to. Um, first of all, let, let me just say that 20% of, of the class being international students is, is, is not a goal. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's not that we're going out and looking for international students to move from 12 to 20%. It's a fact, it's not a goal. We are at 20%, or at least we're close to 20%, and obviously will be at 20% next year if we're not there this year. I'm talking entering the freshman class. Um, that is the result of doing admissions on the merits. Okay, in other words, we're not given a plus or a minus factor if you're an international student, we're just admitting you based on the merits to NYU. And for the moment, we're talking about NYU New York. Because when we get to Abu Dhabi and Shanghai, the rules change completely. But NYU New York, 20% of the entering class, I'm going to say maybe it was 18, but as I say, in a moment, it will be, you know, next cycle will be 20. Simply because of this brand building we talked about earlier. And the fact that 97% of the population that's graduating from high school is graduating outside the United States. And we say, okay, yes, but they're not all studying English, certainly not well enough to study at NYU. There are more people studying English in China than there are studying English in the United States. You just assimilate that number, okay? okay? 12 million high school graduates in China, 7 million of them are, are uh, competent in, 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 in English. Let's say 10% of those, 700,000, are confident at a level sufficient to operate here. It's probably much more than that. That's 700,000 students, okay, uh, that, that, at least in terms of their English, are qualified here. Um, that's just in China. In India, <laughs> they all speak English, <laughs> okay? So, so, so that's another. So, so the, the, you, you'd have to reverse the question. You'd have to say, are we going to put a cap on the percentage of our foreign students? And uh, you know, that would, I would say, be the equivalent of saying 50 years ago or 100 years ago, or this school, thankfully, 150 years ago, are we going to put a cap on filling whatever now you want? Catholic students, Jewish students, black students, women students, you know, and it's not been our tradition. Other places, it's been their tradition, but it's not been our tradition. Uh, I, I was very proud in 1991 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the graduation of the first women from Emily Boston. Okay, and uh, there was a time in the early 1990s, I'm sure it's not true now, but the, 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 if you look at the historically black colleges, the university that was most represented in degrees on the faculty so they started with black colleges was NYU because the, the uh, well, blacks couldn't go to school in the South and they came north to Harlem and they went back as faculty members with the NYU PhDs. But I'm, I'm sure now with the integration of schools in the South that's changed. But I, but but uh, so th this place has not been a let's put a cap on it place. Okay, so then let's just say that number is going to continue to grow. One would expect it's going to continue. So then we get precisely to the question that's asked, which is, are we going to be admitting only the uh, children of the rich? And the first question you have to ask there is, let's go back to Joyce's question, are we going to differentiate between students who have to struggle to afford an NYU education or American and those that aren't? Right now, we're differentiating. And I don't know what the right answer to that is. I know we can't stay in a position where we're not giving any financial aid to just international students. That, that's a different question. We wouldn't have to move immediately to giving the same financial aid. As a general matter, uh, we give about 
20 to 25% of tuition dollars back in financial aid, as, you know, as a general matter. Uh, so uh, that should be 20% for initial I, I don't know the answer to that. Should be five percent. I know the answer to that. Okay, at least five percent. So, so, so now here's where Abu Dhabi and Shanghai become important because by 2020 we will have created 4,000 full scholarships to NYU, funded by the governments of Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. Okay, uh, so so think about that, and that's for students from anywhere in the world. So if you say, okay, now, so, so when I walk into my class in Abu Dhabi now, when I go there next for my class on, uh, on April 20th, which will be my last class in, 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 in the second row, there's a student who saw his mother, his father, and five of his siblings slaughtered in front of him in Rwanda Jetsu. Day and a half to a UN uh, safety camp, two years to a Canadian college. That's where we found him. He couldn't have afforded, he can't afford anything. Okay, he can't afford to buy a sandwich. But because of the blessing of NYU Abu Dhabi, he's getting the best education in the world. He's getting an NYU Global Network of Education. Uh, now, that could also be a kid from Appalachian. First class that we admitted to NYU Abu Dhabi, I'll never forget it, a single mother came up to me over in 19 Washington Square West because we brought the American parents in to tell them, your kid's going to be okay. She's got to remember, his first kids were going off to there was no school. <laughs> you know, his parents are sending their kids, they're going to be the first 150 people to walk into a place called NYU Abu Dhabi, when, when, when half the faculty was still saying, we're opening a campus in Abu Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and the ignorance and the Islamophobia was, was just palpable and everything, and I'm going to send my kids to the Middle And this mother came up to me. She was from West Virginia. She said, I'm a single mom. She said, this is my dream come true. I am going to start now saving so that I can go to his graduation three years from now. Just so I can buy the plane ticket, a $1,500 plane ticket. And I said, I will buy the plane ticket. You don't worry about that. You're going to be there in four years. And that young man is still in the class because no one has left. But uh, so, so that puts a little gloss on this issue of you know, the mix of international students. Because we got a lot of, so 50% of the students that are going to be going into NYU Shanghai will be Chinese. And we've got the financial aid there that we dream of here. So they can be from the western provinces of China. Now, the first class is likely to have, you know, more from Shanghai than not, you know, because again, it's the first class. And we've now completed uh, uh, the admission cycle for the Chinese students, and I want to report to you, I mean, of the 12 million uh, high school graduates, because we were designated first top tier by the Ministry of Education, we're the only university grads out of China that's designated. Uh, we were choosing the 150 we were looking for from the top 60,000 students out of the 12 million. So you were already, you know, talking with an SAT, a perfect SAT schools. Uh, and uh, the class is dazzling. Uh, the, the, the Chinese component is there, but there'll be students from the Western provinces. So, uh, you know, we got to take steps to address this issue so it's not all the students of the foreign elites that are coming in. And we have geographic, and we're going to have to allocate uh, some of the tuition that comes in back into financial aid. Whether it will be at the same level as domestic students or not, that's a policy decision that can be made. Typically, it's made by the deans of the schools with regard to their entrance classes. Uh, and then they give instructions to the admission of financial aid. It's not made at the university level, but I, I have to say that I see the issue, and there are kind of two solutions to the issue. One is the allocation of some of the tuition money. The other is uh, this wonderful uh, influx of students that will come with financial aid from Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. Uh, and, and the one thing I feel pretty strongly this community would not tolerate, and if any of you feel differently, you should email me. But I, I don't think 
anybody, uh, I don't know of any uh, significant group of people here who say put a cap on the international students and turn away students that would otherwise get in the class simply because they belong to that group. Uh, that's not us. With that, I'm going to thank you. Uh, and, and I know we're coming up to exam time for you. I have a couple more student dinners left. Uh, I scheduled it uh, because uh, Lena told me that uh, we kind of run out of them and there was more demand for them. So I scheduled a couple more. One for graduate students, students, right? What? Right, graduate once, students. once for graduate students, yes. Yes, because somebody had asked her specifically about that. So I know at least there's one for graduate students and there may be one for undergraduate students as well. And the way the Yankees are playing on, they released the two dates in April. I was planning to go to Yankee games. <laughs> Although I have to stick with it, I can't. Uh, can't uh, take care of each other. Uh, uh, don't worry about exams too much, but worry about them enough to be ready for them. None of this crazy stuff like this, whatever bull stuff and that other stuff that you that over caffeinates you. That person that drinks 20 cups of coffee a day should be saying that to you, I know. But uh, just you know those drinks. Just be careful about that kind of stuff, okay? You all read about the young woman in Columbia last weekend. That's probably an example of somebody that wanted to do an all-nighter. There's a woman who died last weekend in Columbia, uh, probably from, uh, you know, you've got to be careful. you got to be careful. So take care of each other and be very careful and remember the wellness exchange, okay? If you have more questions for any of us, if you hold your student representatives accountable, our contact information is on your way up. And a lot of us are here afterwards.